So I'm going to welcome you to our healthcare and not warfare, warfare town hall today. I'm very grateful to Plymouth Church for allowing us to come to this lovely venue. Plymouth Church is very famous, I understand, going back to the 1800s, which have always offered people without a voice a voice. Um, this is the third stop in our series. We were south seat in south of Seattle uh, recently, planning on giving this talk again uh, in Everett, all the way up to Bellingham, and then probably later in the summer in Spokane. My name is Anne-Marie Dooley. I'm a doctor and I'm a board member of Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. I am here today because I feel very strongly that we should have better health care for all the money that we spend and maybe less money going to military contracts. Um, we have very skewed spending priorities in, in this country, very skewed. Um, especially our media, which tends to focus on perceived threats. Um, we often hear about a Taiwan or a Chinese jet in the Taiwan Straits, but not on why people are living on our streets and why they have medical debt, why they, have, they don't have access to healthcare, and we're going to focus a little bit on that on this talk today. But um, I have a funny accent, so I better explain that right away. I grew up in the west of Ireland, and my initial uh, introduction to healthcare wasn't at UC Davis Medical Center, it was when I developed appendicitis in college. You know, my father didn't have much money, he made sandwiches and delivered them for a living, and in my last year of college I developed appendicitis. Had a nice doctor come to my room at one in the morning, called an ambulance. I spent three days in the hospital, had my appendix removed, and no bills. Yeah. And you know, Ireland was not a rich country. Uh, it's become richer, but as it has, its health care seems to have disimproved. But I believe we can have nice things in health care in the United States the same way we have in Ireland. Next slide. So there's quite a list of people who are supporting this talk, healthcare and not warfare. Uh, I mentioned Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. Uh, there's Physicians for Social Responsibility, which is a national organization with the Demand Access Group, which are encouraging young physicians to get active in advocating for healthcare for everybody, single payer. Uh, there is whole Washington, of course, representatives in the room who have worked very, very hard. I see hands waving in the background on working policy uh, through Olympia to get single payer in Washington State and worked on the economic aspects and the political aspect sides of it. Uh, we have physicians for a national health program, you'll hear a speaker who have worked for decades on getting single payer in the United States. And then we have the Union of American Dentists and Physicians which speaks for itself and then the Washington Poor People's Campaign which has a national campaign actually asking the question constantly why poverty is the fourth leading, leading cause of death in the United States and why we can change that. And then, of course, the Washington State Nurses Association, who I work at Overlake, where I practice on ending traffic violence on our streets. They have always been advocates of public health and increasing access. Next slide. So here's the plan for today and the agenda. You always have to have an agenda. I will be doing the introduction, which I just gave. Um, I will be talking a little bit about kind of our shared values in the room and what our focus is on today when we share our stories, and we will get a chance to share stories. Uh, the focus of the talk is obviously on healthcare and not warfare, and why this is so important and why our focus seems to be on the latter right now. And then we will be having the ability to share our stories in a little bit talking about medical debt, uh, by some experts on that later. And then really focusing that healthcare and changing the, the conversation that really is a human right, the same way I had in Ireland access to healthcare from when I was born, and if I went back to when I died, something that's not available here. And then most important is how you take action. You know, my 17-year-old says to me all the time, why do you do this? It's not gonna, it doesn't do anything. And really, it's the right thing to do. That's why I'm here today. It really is the right thing to do, and it's the people you meet along the way. Next slide. So, so what is healthcare and not warfare? Well, this is really a community conversation um, led by health professionals and, and by patients um, about the complete dysregulated U.S. healthcare. I wouldn't even call it a system, how fragmented it is and what our national spending priorities are. And when I talk about 
what our spending priorities are, where we spend our money, what our budgets look like, not just at the federal level, but at the county level and at the city level. Uh, we really, our budgets are a statement of what our moral priorities are. They really are a statement as to where we spend, we spend our money. Often our media focuses, and I'll mention the media a lot, on, on other things. Um, unless you're about a budget policy wonk, you're not going to know about what budgets are unless our media uh, reports on budgets. And our media is not doing a very good job of that. Next slide. So I'm talking here as a health professional. I think you know, there, there's a slide that will address this, this later on as to why uh, health professionals have a unique voice. We have experienced a lot, seen a lot of people who suffer because of healthcare. Uh, I certainly have. Um, we do have a voice. You know, we're not trained as medical professionals to speak up. I mean, part of the way you get through medical school is by people keeping your head down. You know, medical school is very militarized. We have chiefs of staffs, we have house officers, and nobody gets through medical school really about speaking up, so you almost have to learn an anti-skill and uh, forget all the things you learned in med medical school and training and speak up, because we do have a voice. Medical debt is skyrocketing, healthcare costs are skyrocketing, while our military spending just goes up. In fact, the tensions we have now um, means we are closer to nuclear war than probably we were when John F. Kennedy was president in the early 60s. Next slide. This is a busy slide, but I think the synopsis of this slide at the very top, you can see that almost half of Americans have a very difficult time accessing health care. Even those with medical insurance have a difficult time accessing health care. And, of course, it's always worse for those who are poor, those who are from low-wealth communities, those who are from black and brown communities, Native American communities have difficulty accessing health care. And I mentioned a story when I was growing up, because we didn't have any money, but I had access to health care. Um, I'll tell you a story about one of my patients who I'm seeing right now. He's a young guy in his 20s and he works full time, he's on dialysis. And he works every single day, gets home, puts himself on dialysis, he tries to do schoolwork at night to finish his degree, and then he does DoorDash at the weekends to try and make money uh, to pay his bills so he can get a kidney transplant. And meanwhile, I spoke, to, spoke about budget priority, priorities. The city of Seattle right here is talking about cutting wages for DoorDash and delivery workers. So really our budgets really do speak to our morals. This guy has at least four jobs. Um, and some people in America would say, as I've heard George Bush say, isn't that great? Four jobs, hard worker, but he shouldn't have to do this. Um, even with health insurance, he's working an unbelievably hard time trying to get a kidney transplant. So why are we here with people working three jobs and not focusing on their health. Well, Eisenhower is the first person who mentioned it in his farewell speech. He was worried about the amount of spending that was going to military budgets and the armaments industry. And you can see from this slide on the left, and this is data from 2021, the spending on our US military budget is now above 800 billion. It's probably 900 billion. And the spending of the US military and the armaments industry isn't even close to the nine next countries combined. And again, you know, when we hear about the media focusing on, on threats, and they're real, and you know, we worry about nuclear war, you know, when a Chinese jet flies down the Taiwan Strait, it makes us want to worry, and it somehow justifies our military spending when it actually increases the risk of military spending and putting ships through the Taiwan Strait when we could spend it on something else. You know, it's funny, I've read a lot about Eisenhower, and people probably know his speech warning us about the armaments industry, but he also said, God help anyone in the office of the presidency who has no military experience, because the military always overstate the threat, and they always overstate their spending requirements and spending needs. Um, 
You know, the U.S. police force uh, also spends a lot of money. And if it was a military or a country, its spending would be probably the third biggest of countries in the world. You can see the U.S. is the top. China is far behind. I keep mentioning China and the Taiwan Strait. And number three is the U.S. police force. Uh, and again, we budget our priorities. In Seattle right now, I mentioned they're talking about cutting the budget and cutting money for the minimum wage for DoorDash delivery workers. And at the same time, they're talking about increasing bonuses for a police force and increasing spending on policing. And this isn't an argument to whether you don't like the police or don't like the military. You know, General Eisenhower realized that to get his priorities through, he cut the military by 30%. And he cut the army, where he had spent 40 years, he cut their budget by 40% because he knew we wouldn't be able to spend on highways, on hospitals, on getting his priorities through. So right now, the spending we have in our police force, we really have to think and ask questions as to why we're spending more on police and not more on social workers, getting people off the streets. Again, we, we budget our priorities, our moral priorities. So why are we doing this? And you know, why are we talking about healthcare and not warfare? Why do I do this as a physician? Well, I think I mentioned before that physicians have a unique voice. Um, they've been doing studies going back to the 1970s on who uh, do Americans trust the most. And nurses are high on the top. I hear, see arms waving at the top. And I'm always trying to get the nurses to come out because they're truly trusted. Next are physicians. Very, very trusted voice in our community. And we do have a voice. Uh, people do listen to us. I, you know, I, I remember the first time I went to Olympia. <laughs> I was down there with a bunch of constituents. I just went down. It was about healthcare and climate issues and some of the constituents, we met in a group, there was nine of us, and they said to me, well, you should be the voice when we go meet our senator. And I was like, well, why would I do that? Because, again, based on the studies here, as health professionals, anybody, even remotely linked to healthcare pharmacists, you know, they're, they work every day with patients, they really do have a trusted voice. What you don't see down at the end of this chart here is the people least trusted, and those are the bankers, and I'm sorry if there's any bankers in the room but they keep getting fined billions of dollars by the federal government for lying. So they're probably not right at the bottom of the list. Next slide. So we're going to have, a, you know, shared values. We talk a lot about budget priorities here, and we spend an awful lot of money on health care, and we get very, very little for it in terms of full coverage of everybody. Um, I think, and we'll hear a lot about this talk, is that everybody has the right to health care. Um, a lot of people are going to share stories. I think you're going to have an opportunity to share your story um, today. I want us all, as much as possible, to, uh, to be respectful of people's stories. Everybody has, has different experiences. Um, I'm going to share one story with you today. Uh, just last Sunday, I met somebody who has better access to health care uh, in prison, as he should, than the women that he beat with a metal pole. Um, and I don't, I think people in prison absolutely should have access to health care, but when you beat someone with a metal pole and they're left with debt, uh, only in America are they left to pay medical debt and recover from that. Um, and that needs to change. And... And uh, that's what we're going to hear more about today. And I think the next slide. Do you want to yeah. Choice? So the next speaker and the next slide, I've talked long enough, is going to be Dr. Hugh Foy, who is a retired general surgeon. And he is a founding member of the Chapter for Physicians for a National Health Program, and also on the board nationally. And he will continue our conversation today. Thanks, Anne-Marie, and thank you all for coming. Uh, this subject's near and dear to my heart. Uh, speaking of incarceration and health care, I worked <clears throat> the last 27 years of my 40-some year career at, at Harborview as a general surgeon. So I spent a lot, they say, oh gosh, did, did you, you're an ER doc. No, I, I, I worked in the ER, I worked in the ICU, I worked in the operating room, the clinic, and I, I got to work all over, which was a great thing. 
particularly somebody with recovering ADD, as uh, I've been accused of in my past. <laughs> but we used to joke a little bit to ourselves uh, we are down there because we would see the jail people from the jail because it is a designated health care provider for uh, all the incarcerated people here in, in our community. <laughs> We'd say, well, bad news is you're in jail. The good news is now you're fully covered. And uh, as long as someone is incarcerated, the government is uh, required and obligated to take care of their health care expenses. It's when they leave incarceration that it then becomes a worse problem. To Just to illustrate, I think, our situation that we have in this country now, and I, I, I consciously eliminate from my vocabulary the word system, because we don't have a system in this country. What we have is the last vestige of the gold rush where everybody is scrambling to scratch the last nickel off the table. And whether it's, it's con, a consolidation and conglomeration of healthcare facilities or health uh, providers' practices uh, or a variety of different schemes, Medicare Advantage, it can go on and on. The goal of everybody is to grab that last dollar while you can. In contrast to Anne Marie's appendicitis story in her home country of Ireland, my boss, who was one of the leaders of American surgery, goes to a conference on the East Coast and he invites his family along because they're going to be included and in, he's going to be honored by this great position. Well, his daughter, who was in college, gets appendicitis. She goes down the street to the, one of the most famous hospitals in the world. She gets her appendix out, spends about 12 hours there, and they get billed $45,000 because they were out of network. And this is someone who could pay for any health insurance, okay? So even the fully insured now in this country, and many of you, I don't, I'd love to see a raise of hand. How many of you have health insurance, but yet you've had trouble accessing health care? I mean, right, you call and what do they say? Well, primary care, it's a couple of weeks. Uh, and for specialty care, it's three months. I took a straw poll of some of my surgical colleagues over the last several weeks uh, as I was preparing for another presentation. They're all booked out for at least three months for uh, non-emergent and non-urgent operations of one sort or the other, whether it's general surgery or orthopedics, etc. So we've got, we've got a real problem. This combination of this gold rush in this country just gets worse and worse as time marches on. 2003, the Bush administration started something called Medicare Advantage. How many of you have seen the Medicare Advantage advertisements on TV? If you watch daytime TV, over and over, over, and, over and over, there's channels where it runs yeah. continuously with a variety of different celebrities, Joe Namath, you name whoever, who you can get hearing aids, I like to think of them as senior earbuds, uh, hearing aids, dental care, uh, vision, glasses, etc. The problem is, it's not Medicare, okay? That law passed in 2003 allowed private for-profit insurers to use the word Medicare in the title of their plans. But what they are is for-profit HMOs. Everybody knows what an HMO is? Health maintenance organization in a, in a truly non-profit like Group Health that we had that started here in Seattle, which was one of the first. It's a capitated budget per uh, prescriber or patient, and you know you have that m amount of money to help take care of that patient. And you have to use evidence-based care based on what you know is the best, not just for a population but for individuals, to be as efficient as possible to use that money. And there's less of incentive to do more procedures, you know, turn more widgets because you're not doing piecework. You're taking care of a group of people. But Medicare Advantage is for-profit 
health maintenance organization where the way they make their money is by doing less. And they, they're actuaries. They know, they know the numbers. They, they know exactly what they can get by with in most circumstances. So, for example, one of the biggest problems with Medicare Advantage is prior authorization. So when you go to see your provider, your physician or your PA or your nurse practitioner, and they order a test, most of the time it has to be pre-authorized by those insurance companies before they can even or order it, okay? And story after story of people who get delays in care due to this prior authorization. The flip side of that is the inefficiencies that it brings to the practice of medicine where you have got to hire dozens of people to do this paperwork or phone work or computer work in order to get what you know is me ne medically necessary for your patient. For example, Vancouver General, just 140 miles north of us up here in BC, they have about six billing clerks for that entire huge hospital. You take some place like Harborview, we've got over a hundred to do the same kind of work because of these multiple layers due to multiple insurers, right? Well, the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare. I try to eliminate that from my lexicon, too. Well, look, the Affordable Care Act violated insurance principle number one, which is a large risk pool. We're all going to put our money in so because we know a certain amount of us are going to need it, and so we all share that, that pool of money. Well, what it did is it took a big risk pool and turned it into hundreds of risk puddles. So no wonder they cost so much and they deliver so little. So it's not a system. It's not a system. It's a profit-driven, laissez-faire, hands-off gold rush. And that's the situation we have in this country now. Um, next slide, please. So we have, as a consequence, still, despite the, that we've diminished the number of uninsured in this country, we still have a large number of them. And even worse, now after the pandemic, early retirement, uh, burnout, also known as moral injury, where people who took an oath to take care of people and save lives are now being pressured and forced by large corporations to turn more widgets, do more procedures, see more patients, uh, etc. It, it, it has become a true abomination to the point where now even fully insured people have a huge problem accessing health care. My wife calls what I do for two hours, three hours a day as Hughes Home Health Care. I'm retired now. But I spend at least two hours on a day helping friends and family who call me access, navigate uh, health care. Who do I go to? Where do I go? Even, to, you know, what do I say? They don't listen to me. I told my brother-in-law, just go to the ER in mid-morning, in mid-week, go today if you can. He says, I can't go today. I got, he lives in the islands, which is another whole problem locally. If you live in the San Juan Islands, you virtually don't have health care. I said, go to that closest ER and get on the ferry. Walk in that ER and tell them that same story. Well, sure enough, rather than go into a clinic where his EKG was normal, they said, you're being admitted. We're, we're going to cath you as soon as possible. And, they, and then when, once he got a coronary catheterization, he says, your disease is so bad, you've got to go down to Everett and get open heart surgery. So it, it, it has become outrageous. It's become practically impossible for the vast majority of people. And if you look at different studies, some of the people who complain the least are people who have nothing because, and I had a brother who had that. He was on Medicare, he was Medicaid, he had no resources. So he basically got his health care for free. But you have got to be spent down to federal 
poverty levels until you have that kind of backup and insurance. And for the vast majority of people in this country, uh, that's not possible. Um, or it's impractical. People exhaust their nest egg forever. Next slide. Cheap insurance is cheap insurance. It's really great until you really need it. And so the way that these plans get manipulated, organized, and designed is that the price will cost you less if you have a high deductible, the amount you've got to pay before you, don't, before you no longer have to put in your, your more money to make it up, high co-pays, which is the amount you slam on the table when you walk in that they'll ask you up front. My elderly sister has vascular disease. So she was home health care. Uh, you know, I, I find her an appointment. She goes up the hill here. She goes in to get, and she gets an appointment to see a vascular surgeon. Before she even shows up, she gets a text message, not once, six times, offering her the option to pay full price up front. Now imagine if you've got a serious vascular problem, you're poor, you're on Medicare, you're on Medicaid, and then you get this, and they want $640 up front before you actually see a provider. Though, and I went nuts. I went nuts. I called the people in the organization, and I said, because I, you know, uh, you know, hi, I'm Hugh. I'm a recovering professor of surgery. So I have a little bit of cachet. I know who to call at least. That and five bucks will get me a cup of coffee. But I call these people, and I say, you have got to be kidding me. Do you want to be on the top of the front page like Providence Healthcare was? Yeah, on the New York Times for doing this kind of stuff? Two-thirds of them said, oh, my God, I didn't even know it was happening. One-third of them said, well, you know, that's just the way it is. And that's the way it is. So all of these different arrangements, and if one group's doing it, well, the other group thinks they can do it and get away with it, too. And they, I mean, that's really, if you will, medical health terrorism, particularly for poor indigent and infirm people. It's, well, it's like, you know, Robert De Niro, he got a lot of press this week. That's like in the old gangster movies. That's what they call a shakedown, right? Spook people, instill fear in them so that they pay you so you don't beat them up or break your windows. Um, so, it's a problem. Next slide. Well, for a long time, one of our major allies in this scenario have been the unions. And the unions, bless their heart, have used health insurance as one of their major uh, attractions to get people to sign on, and also a bargaining chip when they go to management to try and get a new contract. It's a big chunk. I mean, the indirect costs, which, you know, direct costs are salary, the benefits, indirect costs are 21% of the total cost of hiring a single person, what's known in the parlance as a FDE, a full-time equivalent. So the unions have always been our allies. But what's happened to the unions since 1980 is they've been systematically shoved to the side and to the point where they had no longer had the political voice and, of course, our Supreme Court in all its wisdom says that money is free speech. So they lost their clout and their contribution power to politicians because now bribery is legal in this country because it's free speech. So the, thank God the, lunar, the unions are starting to gain strength once again because people realize they've been had. They've been squeezed out on both ends. So, um, you know, we can go on to the inflation of CEO salaries. I looked at some data the other day looking at the last 20 years. The ratio of a CEO's salary to the average rank-and-file worker is now over 200 to 1 and greater. 30 years ago, it was maybe 4 to 7 
times the average worker. And why did, why did they do that? They get stock options, right? They get stock options, they roll them over, they hold back their quarterly report so that their stock bumps up again. And I've seen that in my own personal and professional experience. One of the biggest bumps in the cost of health care in the last 30 years as I worked here has been the implementation of the electronic medical record or the electronic health record. I, can, I know that in one organization I was very familiar with because I was helping them design it as a practitioner, they came to town, they pitched their product, we said, can we see it? And they go, well, we didn't bring that much. We thought we had bought, as, as our hospital medical director said, we thought we bought a Lexus where we could put the key in, turn the key, and drive it off the lot. What it turned out, it was car parts. It was crates of car parts, and they weren't, they were used Toyota car parts. They kept us on our heels, kept calling us stupid because we didn't know how to use it, and I went to Chicago to see if they had it, because they said they did, because they had a friend in Chicago. And I said, so where's your physician order entry? And they go, well, you know, that module was expensive. And I went to St. Paul's in Vancouver to see another, the rate, one button push, you can see the x-ray. I said, can you show me your x-ray deal? Well, we didn't buy that module. You know, we didn't buy that crate of car parts uh, to this deal. So Etherware was sold, and when we thought we'd pay X, when we purchased it, it took us 10X dollars and 10 years to get the Lexus to drive off the lot. And it was a self-assembled used Toyota. And now it's come down, like everything else in the business, to consolidation, right? We can do better together. We have economy of scale. This will, this will help you, right? Now it's one, there, there's two major health record companies in this country. It's like Ford and GMC is what it's come down to. And they banter back and forth and leapfrog each other with technology. And they keep the price elevated. And they're both proprietary arrangements where you can't get in and look at the code, unlike the Veterans Administration and their electronic medical record, which was done as an open source, not-for-profit development done by in-house uh, doctors and computer scientists, many of them who had dual skills. So the electronic medical, you just take one organization in one city, and they thought they were going to pay X million, and they ended up paying 10X million. You multiply that across the entire country, and you can see why the cost of health care has gone up and up and up and now into the stratosphere. So it isn't a system. I'm sorry. It's the last vestiges of the gold rush. Um, so I'm going to turn it over now uh, and... Uh, Gary? Uh, Britt. Oh, wait, I have one more thing. No, I, I'll do that later. Sorry. Britt, sorry. Hi, my name is Britt. I'm a registered nurse. I will not state my employer to spare a little scrutiny, but I've worked in many places, including jail have a lot of good stories from there. Uh, most of my work's been in mental health and behavioral health. So uh, I think I hit my eight-year anniversary this year. Um, I was selected to talk about the warfare slides, uh, but I have a problem in visualizing big numbers like a billion and a trillion. So I, I went to Google to kind of help myself see those numbers a bit better. Uh, I think that time is a more relatable concept. So when we look at a million dollars, 
we can turn that into a million seconds, and that's 11 and a half days, just nonstop. A billion dollars can be a billion seconds. And that turns into 32 years. I turned 34 in August, so it's a long time to me at least. Uh, One trillion dollars is 32,000 years, so we have 64,000 years, second dollars up there for just our nuclear weapons. Uh, another fun fact is the earliest archaeological record of warfare was about 14,000 years ago. Uh, and then one of our closest military welfare recipients, I guess we'll call them, uh, Israel, they have a universal health care system, and in 2020, which is not the most efficient year for any of our systems, um, theirs was the third most efficient, and ours was, well, I couldn't find it, but it's probably at the bottom of the list. So. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, so, once again, Congress just passed a bill giving more money to more warfare um, around the world and in our own country. And in the amount of $92 billion, which is a lot of years if we're going to go back to our, our analogy there. And that's enough to build 460 $200 million hospitals. And I know that in our state we're pretty lucky in the I-5 corridor where most of us happen to live, but those of us that don't rely on pretty small critical access hospitals that are still hard to get to. Um, I've spoken to nurses working at one where they have six beds in their ER and one nurse, and I thought, oh, wow, <laughs> I could not do that myself. Um, but that's just the reality of the situation. Um, I think everybody deserves health care, no matter living in a metro area or in the middle of, of nowhere, someone who grew up kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, so. That's a lot of hospitals. Um, and we have the money to make it accessible for everybody because no matter how many hospitals you might have, like us being here in Seattle, we have some of the, I think, finest research hospitals uh, in the world and country. I'm sure that other people might disagree. Um, but a lot of those aren't accessible with uh, even average health insurance benefits. Um, you know, my grandmother is... 81, and she still works, and she has Medicaid, no, she's Medicare, and she still pays a premium, and I, I'm not happy about that. I was helping her sort out and navigate some of the uh, kind of rough waters of um, those processes, because she has no idea, and people send her kind of predatory things like Medicare Advantage plans, and she thinks, well, do I need this? Is this Medicare on it? Um, you know, it, it, it's purposely confusing. Um, and instead of dedicating money to, you know, the variety of, I guess we could call them proxy wars at this point, to Medicare for all will go a long way. Um, Dr. Foy talked about prior authorizations. Most of my day is spent on prior authorizations, unfortunately. They are the bane of my existence as a nurse. I would much rather be talking to patients and their families all day, um, providing direct care, more intensive or holistic care. Um, I'm kind of sweating this month because a couple of my prior authorizations expired. <laughs> so uh, without those, you know, a few of meds I take for migraines would round out to about $2,400 a month if insurance didn't deign to cover them. So uh, I'm I'm pretty sure they'll they'll get re-upped, but you never you never know. It's always a, a surprise game with insurance companies. So Medicare would go a long way to making care not only more accessible, but more predictable, because patients can go days without a med they've been on for years. I'm sure multiple people in this room have experienced that, um, and that's suboptimal care. It's, to me, unacceptable. Uh, and I've spent hours on the phone with some of the worst hold music in the world <laughs> trying to fix those <laughs> same day, but it's not always possible. So, uh, you know, but we, we as nurses really do try hard to, to cut through as much of that um, very expensive red tape as possible. So, and everyone has a story about it too, like mine with my migraine medications. Um, a lot of people are in really expensive meds. We have great technology these days. A lot of medications are moving towards things called biologics. They're very effective. They're very expensive. Very proprietary. Um, you know, and that they're they're hard to afford, and we're running into shortages too, so it really is kind of a free-for-all 
gold rush situation. Um, I think it's story time. Um, now is the portion of our town hall where we want to hear from you. So, um, if you want to speak, um, just ask that you don't go super long. <laughs> um, but and, and we also want to ask that everyone just just respects folks who are sharing. I mean, there's some very personal uh, stories out there. Um, so, if you want to speak, uh, go ahead and raise your hand, um, and you're welcome to come to the podium to speak into the mic, which will subject you to our camera. So if you don't want to be on camera, uh, you can you can kind of go to that mic. Um, but yeah, do we have any brave volunteers who want to share a personal healthcare experience or maybe something that one of their patients has, has experienced? Okay. Okay, come on up. If you want. <laughs> well, I don't want to be on camera. All right, that, that mic. So just a personal uh, experience is, is you know, cell phones and all that. So I was at my union hall, and um, this guy had a ringtone on, the music, and I kept going on and on and on and on, and he wasn't able to hear it. It was like this far away. And I was wondering, What's, where's this music coming from and all that? So he's like in his 60s, and I guess he's just kind of losing his hearing. So it was just strange to me, you know, I thought maybe it's, you know, something somewhere else or something, you know. So it's kind of sad to see that, to see, have somebody just talking away, and he's got his phone down, and it's loud, and he's not able to pick it up and to turn it off and all that, you know, this far away from him and I just, just talking like this. So, yeah, that was kind of a wake-up call, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Brought to you by the country where uh, teeth and ears are not healthcare. <laughs> and eyes. And eyes. <laughs> um, okay, we've got somebody from the back. Do you want to come up? Uh, yes, this, now this isn't the worst story in the world, and I'm sure others have much worse than this, but I was without health insurance for several weeks this winter because of a misunderstanding because I was switching from paying by myself through, through to paying through Obamacare because it turns out I, quali I qualify for a subsidy because my health insurance went up significantly. So I guess due to a misunderstanding over the phone, um, it turns out I didn't find out I was cut off. They didn't tell me I was going to get cut off until I got some money returned to me. It took me a while to figure out what was going on. And the attitude of the people at the call center was like, whatever, they didn't really care, and I can't hold it against them. I'm sure those jobs suck, and they don't pay very well. But it just kind of illustrates the impermanent nature of health insurance, and now fortunately nothing bad happened to me. But still, it, it, it really sucks. It's really stupid that I have to deal with something like this. It just should be there and provided without question. Uh, Catherine, you want to come up? Just keep the applause going. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to share something that happened recently. There's a couple things, but um, I think I'll go back to the one that happened, I think, towards the end of our last initiative campaign with um, one of our volunteers kind of had to back away because his mother was in hospice care and he was taking care of her. And he let us know via our chat thing that um, while he was taking care of her affairs and stuff, he'd found that um, she'd left uh, this world with over, I, I really, I can't remember the exact number. It was either, it was over a million, but I think it was six million dollars of medical debt. from, And she was on hospice for like, you know, and I was like, what the heck? How does anybody even accrue that much medical debt? Oh, how is that even possible? So 
Um, and the other one, real quick, is um, I was talking to somebody else just recently, and when it was online, but they were talking about the frustrations they had that they helped out their daughter when their daughter was pregnant. Her significant other didn't, or her husband, I think it was, but they, he didn't think it was necessary for her to have health insurance. So, well, they had complications. She had to have C-section, and the, it ended up they had a huge bill. Um, they originally paid it by putting it on their credit card, and um, and then that they, they could. She lost her job. She wasn't able to make the payments on it and stuff. So, the parents took out a mortgage of a hundred thousand dollars on their home to pay off the credit cards. But now her, they don't know. They think feel like they're afraid they're going to lose their house now because they can't make those additional payments. And it's just wrong that our people work that hard all of their lives and lose all of their savings like that. So, and the one thing that I remember one of these the RIP medical debt or undue medical debt people said is that if you have medical debt, don't put it on a credit card. Don't put it on a credit card because then it doesn't it doesn't even go into the records as being medical debt. It's credit card debt. So, okay. Uh, David. Thanks. I I just want to share a story about a patient that I was involved in. I worked at PacMed for 30 years, and during that time, I got to spend half a day a week in a couple of uh, community clinics, country doctor and international district clinic. And there I saw tons of people come in who didn't, either didn't have insurance or they were underinsured and they knew that they had something that they might end up having to pay for or couldn't pay for and this would be a huge drain on their family and their family wealth and their kids and so on. So I'd see people with you know, abscesses on their foot who are diabetic who, you know, came in late. They couldn't afford the insulin at that point in time. And then they'd end up uh, with an amputation that they wouldn't have needed to have if they had come earlier. But the biggest, the most memorable uh, patient disaster that I was involved in, uh, later on I was, you know, I was still at PacMed, but we, cover, we went to Swedish, so I covered the emergency room, shared it with, I think, five other surgeons. So I was on, you know, night shift, <laughs> actually, uh, from, I think, 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. for five days a week, or six days a week, uh, or the whole week, alternating every fifth week. So this time I got a call, it was in the middle of the night, about a guy who came in with a gangrenous gallbladder. So looking at his uh, social history, he was a truck driver, non-union, didn't have a, uh, and his sort of insurance program had uh, three kids. He was a known hypertensive and had been seen in a community clinic, but he basically couldn't have, he, couldn't afford his uh, full dose of his medic hypertension medication, so he'd kind of skimp on it, take take it every third day or something like that. So anyway, he developed a gangrenous gallbladder, showed up in the middle of the night, so he needed to have emergency surgery. So I got the call for that and went in, and we took him to the operating room. And while well, just after he. The anesthetic was induced and blood pressure dropped to basically zero and uh, stayed there for a little while until they gave him some medicines to artificially bring it up. But we got his gallbladder out, but when he quote woke up, you know, he was really had a devastating brain injury from the time that he was hypotensive and his brain wasn't getting the amount of uh, blood that it needed. So this was again a horrendous thing for himself and his family and the rest of his life and you know the only he thought that or his family thought that maybe suing the hospital and the anesthesiologist would be a way to go to provide some money for their family for the you know their loss of the family income that they did have because this uh, truck driver couldn't work anymore 
So they did sue, and after a bunch of stuff, the hospital made a settlement with them, so they got a small amount of relief, but this devastating thing shouldn't have happened. He shouldn't have had problems paying for his medication, and you know, he would have taken them and probably very likely avoided this hypotensive episode during his anesthesia. So there's still lots of people out there like that who have are underinsured and they avoid the care they need, they come in late. And if you look at the statistics about it, it's about, you know, 50% of people are underinsured and they delay the care that they need and they end up with a lot worse outcomes. Thank you. Hi there. Um, this is just a story about the market, right? People who are against Medicare for All say, oh, the market will take care of it, like the market will set the prices right and the market will sort out the deals between the insurance and the providers. But um, I recently broke both my wrists, which I'm doing great, um, but I, I was paying attention to the bills as they came in, and I have really good insurance, so I'm very lucky. So this is not a story about me being out of pocket. This is a story about the market being just totally out of whack. So the bills for surgery on two wrists plus a bunch of physical therapy added up, I think they're still coming in, but they're, they're around $50,000. The amount the health insurance paid to the provider was $13,000. So like for one, there's no set price. Like there's no list of how much things cost. So like how do you, how do you, the market's not working there. And then the other place the market's not working is like, I'm, I've got two broken wrists, right? I'm not shopping around for who's going to give me the cheapest surgery. Like, I don't have time or bandwidth for that. I don't want the cheapest surgery, right? I just want someone who's going to do a good job. So, the, you know, that argument about the market needs to just be forgotten and go away. We have time for a couple more. Uh, this more. is more a question. Oh, a question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the qu uh, um, I understand that um, having insurance companies have middlemen, which add no particular value; they just have, have overhead, is bad. And single payer would cover would help solve that problem. But what what would solve the problem of the high cost? You know, you talk you hear about people going to Europe to get certain procedures done because it's so much cheaper in Europe, they can live there for months and, and it still costs less than it would cost for the procedure here. So is it just a matter of government controlling the prices, I mean, which I'm fine with, but you know, you know, what explains, is it just greed that explains the high prices? You know, so um, how, what's somebody who understands the medical system explain that because that, that part of lowering prices, please. I would love to explain that. Um, it is, it is great. It's, it's artificial. Uh, my partner years ago before we met was hit by a car. She worked at the Mayo Clinic, thankfully, so it was on the way to work. Swift uh, health care. But she got a bill, of course, <laughs> lots of bills. And on the bill itself, uh, one of the line items was latex gloves because, you know, someone's bleeding, you need those. A single pair was $12, and they used a lot of pairs to take care of her, so because they could. I know that a single pair of gloves doesn't cost $12. Uh, a box at the height of the pandemic might have been $12, but, you know, a lot of it's inflation, it's artificial um, price fixing. Uh, right now, if you have ADHD, like I do, you know, it's really hard to get your medication, there's, I think, three pharmacy benefit managers in the, the whole country that control the majority of prescriptions, prescription processing, and they all talk to each other and set prices, and that's part of the problem, um, is that we don't have a way to negotiate with them. Um, it is very mafia-like, so that's, that's a big component of it. Okay, yeah, one more direct response and then maybe one more story. 
Yeah, the, the other thing is I, I practice actively, and, you know, for example, I give a medicine for anemia related to kidney disease, and the hospital I work at, the patient was very diligent, had all the lists. She said, why does this cost $4,000 every time I get this shot? And I, I couldn't figure it out, because I have to buy it in my own office in Bellevue, and it's $100 a shot, and I said, you come down? I mean, I give it to people for free who don't have insurance, but three or 4000 again, it, for a $100 shot is, is really kind of outrageous. And, and for people who have insurance too, you know, since the pandemic we've had nursing shortages, tech shortages, bed shortages. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you have insurance and you come into the hospital, you may end up sitting in the ER for 12, 24, two days. You may end up being in the closet. It gets, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. So clearly the free market is not working. And uh, I was just going to add a few other direct responses to that, actually. So there, there is a lot of greed in the system. I think that's been well articulated. But it's a horribly, horribly inefficient system. And you could say that it's tolerated because it does make some greedy people very, um, very wealthy and powerful in a certain sense. But, um, you know, when you think about uh, the difference between emergency room care and, say, preventative care, we have a a legal obligation to provide emergency room care to everyone. Um, we don't have a legal obligation to provide good health care to everyone, right? So emergency room care is one of the most expensive forms of care. Going to the doctor regularly um, to get regular checkups and to take care of you know, early detection and early action is many, many times cheaper. But because we have a system that is based around market incentives, um, doesn't provide a guarantee to care of uh, any kind except emergency care, so much of that care gets pushed to the emergency room. We also talked about, you know, the multiple payers, right, and the difference between, say, bulk pricing. So if you ever wonder how can Costco, you know, afford to, you know, give me a burlap sack full of potatoes for, you know, the cost of two at a regular grocery store, it's because they're buying in bulk and they're actually selling at cost and then making most of their money through membership, right? This is like an effective uh, uh, way of distributing the costs um, ahead of time among more people. And so they're not making profits off the actual product, right? They're making it through this membership. And you can think of that as an analogy for insurance in some ways. Um, so there are, there are so many ways in which the system is made inefficient, right? The other one is just, again, by having it split by so many payers, different people, uh, different insurance companies. Um, in addition to that loss of bargaining power with hospitals, with uh, doctors, right, you now have a system in which the hospital itself is, okay, we need, to, we need to be reimbursed, right? Well, some of this comes from the insurer. Some of this maybe comes from the patient. The patient can't afford it. Now it's in collections, right? This is not an efficient way to bill for uh, medical care. Um, and so the, uh, there, there are just, I, I think, you know, I could probably continue to go on and on and on about this. There are so many ways in which the system is inefficient. There's actually, there's one more I wanted to mention, right? So when we think about the cost of, say, physician care, right? Physicians are reimbursed very highly in the United States, and I think people tend to like the idea of, you know, doctors should be paid well. I think we all agree with that. Um, but when you look at the overall system and it expands outside of the healthcare system, right, um, what is the cost of an education in the United States, right? How many uh, figures of medical debt, or sorry, of, of student debt are, ho are doctors coming into their practice with uh, by the time they're even able to start practicing, right? So we are immediately locking out everyone who would like to become a doctor but can't because of high... Uh, education costs, and then on top of that, everyone who does graduate comes into their practice with a huge amount of medical debt, hence high uh, physician fees, right? Um, and, and you can think about housing related to this as well, right? One of the biggest causes of homelessness is medical bills, but then one of the worst things for your health is being homeless. So we really need to take a system-level approach to this and uh, dig deep and think of the many, many different things that contribute to health and to a public health system and a healthy society.
All right, so you've heard some personal stories from folks and a lot more about our um, intractable and difficult to solve <laughs> healthcare system. But um, we actually do have some solutions here today. We, we didn't just come here with, with the problem. Um, and the first thing that, that uh, we want to talk about, um, well, I want to invite back up Dr. Hugh Foy to talk about um, medical debt and what we might do about that. I don't know about most of you, but I had a policy for a long time that I don't pay anything uh, unless I let the dust settle for about three months. Now, there's a delicate balance there because if you wait too late, you'll get sent to collections. And I've been sent to collections at least twice by my own organization because as the bills churn through, and depending on whatever coverage you have, the... Those of us that are 65 and over, right, you get this big report called a COB report, uh, which is a coordination of benefits. And it's very complicated, almost impossible to interpret. And it's basically, it tracks how things are paid. The first person they shake down for the money is the Medicare program, then your supplement plan if you have one, and then whatever copay that you may have. I had a little neurosurgical procedure a few years back. I spent one night in the hospital. I had an operation to take this thing out of my head. It was $60,000. I uh, had a wobbly knee, and um, I got a joint replacement. Again, one night in the hospital, and it was over $45,000. So how does somebody rack up $6 million in debt? It can happen. Uh, one of my best friends got an infected ankle joint. He spent at least six months in the hospital, half of that time in the ICU, had multiple procedures and still lost his foot. Uh, he had to do a GoFundMe campaign yeah, be, for the amount of money he was responsible before, for before they determined he was eligible for Medicaid. So he was on Medicare, which is federal right, and Medicaid, which then picks up the difference for poor people below federal poverty level. Uh, but before, that has to turn through the billing organization until you hit that rock bottom. You know, Well, I, I just looked at his GoFundMe campaign today, and it was $35,000. I asked his daughter, uh, so what was the total bill? And I thought... Hugh, you're being ridiculous. Of course she doesn't know. Nobody knows. The hospital hardly knows what that bill is. But it's in excess of a million dollars, easily. Uh, it, it, the, so, and there is a complete disconnect between price and cost, right? In a, in a place like Canada or France, they know what it costs, right? But in this country, there's very little, if any, regulation on price. So... If a new organization comes in and wants to set a whole different price scale for a certain group of procedures, and that's what happened in plastic surgery. They just decided, well, we're going to get into the business of doing abdominal wall reconstruction and all this other thing. They just came in, and a new plastic surgery practice can just set their own price. I don't know if any of you saw in the, in the news this week of how Ozempic and these type of weight loss drugs run the risk of bankrupting the entire U.S. healthcare system because the price of those drugs in the United States is about five to six times greater than it is in the rest of the world, including the developed countries in Europe. And all the pharmaceutical companies have two pricing structures, and they'll admit it. One is for the rest of the world, and the other one is for the U.S. I mean, in the U.S., due to lack of regulation and oversight, it's license to steal money. That's why you have venture capitalists grabbing fixed, closed practices of ER docs and dermatologists and anesthesiologists and buying those practices because they can charge whatever they want. So... One solution to this is um, the, the uh, medical debt programs, and uh, 
there is uh, the Undo Medical Debt Program. And uh, this used to be called RIP Medical Debt, Rest in Peace Medical Debt. The way that that happens, and if you think back to 2008 and the mortgage banking crisis and everything, a lot of this debt gets conglomerated and bundled. And I'm not an economist or a banker, so I, I'm really out of my wheelhouse. But it gets bundled, and then as David McClanahan said, you, there, it's so much work to get this money, and you can't get blood out of a turnip or a rock. So the debt gets bundled, and then it gets sold on a different secondary market to people. Well, the reality is, in this campaign, a couple of former collection executives got together and knowing what they know, that you can buy $100 worth of debt for a dollar if you buy it in these negotiated secondary market bundles. So they've started this campaign to get rid of medical debt, and that's what they do. So they take money, mostly from donations, and they buy these bundles of medical debt. And someone asked, you asked earlier, well, how does an individual then apply for this? That's where it gets a little tricky and a little difficult because they don't have the ability up front to know where in that bundle one individual's debt may be. But what they do is they buy it up and then after the fact, when they can collect the paperwork, then they can go back and contact the people. So... This is a pitch, or as my wife and I have dubbed it in an acronym, this is a GIBO, get your checkbook out. Uh, you can donate to this uh, uh, program, and there's a, um, that QRS code to forget medical debt or undomedicaldebt.org. And you can go on their website, and I'll... Full disclosure, I'm an instant expert. I, I knew very little about this until to prepare for this thing today. I went and I did a little uh, homework and research. But it, it's a good program. It's not kind of a, a linear one-to-one -one phenomenon, but it, it relies on this phenomenon of, of bundled debt. So if any of you are interested, go to that website, copy that QR code, and if you're in uh, any any way able, you can do that. On their website, there are some phenomenal examples of donors who have done this. One of them in our own community was uh, Jeff Bezos' ex-wife. <laughs> she gave an enormous amount of money uh, to this. Mackenzie Scott donated $50 million to this program. So you multiply that times 100, and you can, and it, it's estimated if we used some of this money that we're, you know, making bombs and missiles and, uh, you know, all these armaments that are designed and funded which will annihilate human life on our planet and beyond, we could easily erase medical debt as it exists right now. Our organization's Physicians for a National Health Program did a study that came out a couple of, uh, it's about 15 years ago now, uh, from the Harvard School of Public Health looking at medical debt. And they did surveys of people, why did you file for bankruptcy? More than half of the people who file for personal bankruptcy in this country file citing medical expense debt as the major factor that drove them to bankruptcy. That statistic alone makes me shudder. But even worse was, of those people who filed for that reason, 76% of them had health care insurance coverage at the time they were either injured or fell ill to a major illness like cancer or, or the like. So it's a big problem. It's a huge industry. And why do they do it? Because they can, right? As the old story goes. Somebody, you had your hand raised?
Well, I mean, it's stupid. it is stupid. It is stupid, but there's a, there's a lot of money on the table, and that's the momentum in the deal. And the, the Citizens United decision w- made it go from bad to worse to horribly unbelievable. There are more lobbyists in Washington, D.C. for the health insurance and pharmaceutical and medical uh, industry than any other entity, right? United Healthcare, excuse me, now known as Optum, right up the hill here, took over Polyclinic, right? Is what, the fourth largest corporation in our country right now? Why do they do it? Because they can. And there's a lot of money on the table, and it's just licensed to steal money. I had a colleague who was a nephrologist who I had on a panel a couple years back at one of our surgery meetings, and I, I said, so what are we going to do? He says, Hugh, American healthcare is one of the hottest commodities on the international venture capitalist hit list eh, right now. It's amazing. Yeah, it's frightening. So, again, um, we've got some information over here. This is my pitch that i got to do for our organization's Physicians for National Health Program. Uh, we have a couple of things. If you go to the website, it's just pnhp.org. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of slide decks and presentations, but most notably, there's two reports. One is a report that came out uh, two years ago, uh, and the other one just last week. And the one that came out uh, a year and a half ago is about how Medicare Advantage programs have overbilled the federal government in 2022, one year alone, to the tune of between 80 to 140 billion dollars. So that's how big a deal it is. And it is it is draining the Medicare trust fund that we all paid into all of our working lives, right? It's right it's a line out on, on your check stub, right? We pay into that every month, but I'll tell you what, for those of you who aren't 65 yet, you still pay for it every month even after you're retired. It comes out of your Social Security benefit. So you never see it. It's invisible money. It's kind of like your employer paying for your health insurance. You don't pay attention, you don't see it. It comes out of your Social Security benefit on a graduated scale, given the fact that as a surgeon, I had reached that top of the scale, but I can tell you that is $435 per person per month that they take out of your Social Security, not just for me, but also for my wife. So that's $900 a month that we pay for our free Medicare Classic. But then we got to go pay another $1,200 for a supplement to cover it. Now, it's, it's, it's a good plan, right? It's, but So almost $2,000 a month for insurance for something that's supposed to be a guaranteed benefit that we paid for all our working lives. So check out our website. There's, there's that uh, uh, thing about uh, the overbilling and upcoding by Medicare Advantage plans. And just last week, the Medicare, Medicare Advantage harms report is, is hitting the press that further documents how big a deal this is. And it gets worse every day. Yes? No, they get billed, and that's the people that really get taken, are the people in the middle. They get paid, they get billed full retail price, and that retail price can be all over the map. It just depends on what those people want to do. But if you get stuck, you you don't want to go on credit cards, because those things are tumor loans, right? Uh, And what you want to do, and and if you go to the Undo Medical Debt website, there's a whole page of recommendations and guidelines for what you should do with your medical debt. So that's a great question. Let's, uh, let's save yep. the rest of the questions. So, yeah, we got a, One more? You had a question? Oh, I did. 
I, maybe we ask later, but I don't understand what it means to purchase debt at a steep discount and forgive it. I don't know who's paying the debt, who's getting, who's not getting the money. I don't know what that means. But maybe later explain that. Yeah, and, and I, I, I'm not an economist, but it, it, it's it's <laughs> like. Uh, a former president said, it's healthcare, it's complicated. Well, this is banking, it's complicated to me, and I know nothing about it. But this is bad debt. They bundle bad debt. Yeah? The short answer is, this debt is highly recognized as being very unlikely to ever be paid. So debt collectors basically attempt to sell it. What can we get for it, right? And so under medical debt, and, and in collaboration with some state governments, that basically managed to buy this debt at times pennies on the dollar and relieve a much greater amount of debt than they actually paid for. Great. Thank you. One more plug for this uh, undue medical debt. They, part of the reason why they changed their name from RIP to undo is that recognition that we don't need to prop up the system that's broken. We need to undo it. So uh, that's really, they're on board with the, in alignment with undoing the systems that are existing as they are, or non-systems, as Dr. Hugh pointed out. So policy solutions. So I get the, like... Uh, awesome task of letting you know there are things that we can do about this in Washington State um, to make this better for everyone. Um, I suppose I should introduce myself. Uh, My name is Carrie Wallace. I am a nurse by background. Um, I've worked in a lot of different nursing capacities. I've worked in a jail. I've worked hospice. I've worked in a hospital, mostly med surge, a little bit of everything. And then I managed the dialysis units in the Longview Kelso area for over a decade. And dialysis is one of the few areas that are a Medicare-entitled disease population, right? So folks who have um, kidney disease that need dialysis are entitled to Medicare in a way that no one else is unless they're over 65. And so there's a lot of really good population management that has come out of that uh, Medicare entitlement, if you will, and also a lot of really good representations of greed in the system. The for-profit companies that run dialysis are really global monopolies. They own this. They own the units. They own the machines. They own the medicine. They own the, the bloodlines that go on the machines. Like it's, it's really a very good representation of the unfettered capitalism that exists in our country. So um, that's my background for the majority, and, and I think there's a much better way to do this. Uh, this slide represents why universal health care is important. So if you can afford good health care in our country, you can live longer, you can live more well, you can, your mort- morbidity and mortality is expected to be much better than if you can't afford health care. And this is Washington State. So each dot here represents a county in Washington. The more people that can't afford to go to the doctor, uh, the higher they are, their mortality rate. So the more likely they are to die because they can't afford to get health care in our state. Next slide, please. Um, Medical billing, uh, we've talked about insurance companies. We pay up front. We give them our premiums. We give them our tax dollars straight out of our paychecks up front. And they have no incentive to give us care from there. They make money by denying our care, by delaying our care, by creating things like networks that don't need to exist that cause us difficulty and barriers in actually receiving health care. And, and that's the way the system's set up, right? So it's set up not with a patient in the center, which is where moral injury comes from. When you're working as a healthcare professional, as a doctor, as a nurse, our primary goal is to take care of that patient at the center of their care. The systems that we're working in are not designed to do that. So that's where burnout and moral injury and those concepts come in because we have to fight every day against this non-system to get patients what they need, to help them navigate the systems, to help them try to find ways to afford the medications, um, to sit on the phone for hours uh, with prior author- authorizations, etc. cetera. Um, so the, really, the, the incentives are backwards. We've already talked about hospital consolidation. Um, this is a benefit to the hospital to bulk their services. It is not a benefit to patients. They're able to price fix. They're able to give us the bare minimum that they can get by with because the, the bean counters know in the background you know, what the risk is of where that quality level lies, and that's really unfortunate. 
Um, a small story, there's a, um, the HCA, not the Washington HCA, but there's a healthcare um, hospital company that owns a great deal of hospitals and clinics across our country. And the people who purchased HCA, created HCA, had originally, they were going to purchase KFCs and franchise Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants and realized that there's far more money in a hospital system than in KFC, so that's why they run those companies. So um, it's a huge issue. This, this huge medical conglomerate corporation is a huge issue. Um, Andre talked a little bit about preventative care. We should be focusing on wellness. We should be focusing on you know, getting folks in for screening and for um, just annual uh, uh, appointments and such. But even myself, I have really good insurance. It's $160 for me to go to the doctor out of pocket, right, with my insurance. So I have to think, is this really worth $160 today? And, and that's just sad. And I know I'm not the only one, like, looking at, do I, I really need to spend this $160? Uh, we talked about we pay more than any other country for the same medications. Big Pharma is a big deal here. And then our spending per capita. Uh, it, we spend more than any other country per person because of that gold rush concept that um, Dr. Hugh Foy was talking about earlier. And we can fix it. Um, so with the Washington Health Trust, um, I do represent whole Washington. I'm the board chair. I've been the board chair for about nine, ten months now. Um, but I've volunteered for this organization for, uh, since 2016, 2017 uh, with the first initiative. Um, I gathered a whole seven signatures the first time. And then on our last initiative, my group in Cowitz County gathered over 2,000 signatures. Difficult conversation in a more conservative area, but healthcare is a need that everyone has. And so if we can cut through um, the political piece of this and just talk about that healthcare is something everybody needs and that um, this single payer system saves money, it saves time, it could improve quality, it could provide some accountability. Um, it's really good stuff. So uh, these slides have live links to Senate Bill 5335 and Initiative 1471. Those are the most current um, representations of our policy around the Washington Health Trust. Um, we've taken this through the ledge uh, for the last six years in a row, uh, three different bill numbers. We've not had a hearing. So what do we do about it? We need to push our legislatures to listen to us about what our health care needs are. Um, and then with the initiative pathway, Washington is one of the few states in the country um, that actually have this pathway, that we have a true opportunity to participate in our democracy and gather signatures on a petition and submit those to go straight to the ballot, which I think is great. Uh, the Washington Health Trust bill is based off of um, previous work from Healthcare for All Washington. Um, we recognize that there are healthcare providers and, and others that have been working on this issue for decades. Um, healthcare for All Washington is one of those groups. Uh, so great place to start with building on the, the shoulders of giants, if you will. We've also taken some inspiration from HR 676, which is the Medicare for All bill. We've taken some inspiration from Healthy San Francisco, um, which is a single payer, uh, city-based single payer system um, that allowed for, um, uh, they've been able to get through legal challenges around ERISA. I won't go into ERISA, but it's one of the barriers for a state-based single payer system. We vet this language through an employment security department and the Department of Revenue. Every time we have an opportunity to submit the language as a bill or as an initiative, we do have an opportunity to update that policy. So we've taken it through several different groups, um, union policy advisors, those types of groups, um, individuals who are just super policy wonky, uh, would love to have feedback. Um, and so every time we, we have that opportunity, we do take it. Um, and the bill gets better every time. We've reviewed um, with uh, financial analysis. Dr. Gerald Friedman has done a couple of financial studies for us, and uh, the, the takeaway from that is the state could save anywhere from 5 to $9 billion a year by implementing a state-based single-payer system. Um, so we're actually saving a ton of money and still covering every resident of Washington State uh, under the trust. Um, these are the benefits. Uh, thank you. Um, basically, yes, 
everything and yes, everybody. So any question you might have, 99% uh, of the time I'm going to say yes. Yes, everything and yes, everybody. Um, the, the, the reason why that is is because we put everybody in one um, pool of money, right? So, um, so some people need a little more, some people need a little less. We also, my favorite part is remove that for-profit insurance company component from the trust. So it's publicly funded, uh, paid for very similarly to how we pay for insurance now. There's an employer component, there's an employee component, but it's decoupled from your actual employment so that if you want to start your own business or you need to leave jobs or you need to, um, for medical reasons, can't work anymore, the trust is still there. Um, it covers medical, dental, and vision. I, I think it's just absolutely crazy that we have a health care that doesn't recognize the importance of every system in our, in our human body. Um, you know, our dental care is really tied to our cardiovascular health. Folks that struggle to get their dental care taken care of, it can actually increase your risk of cardiac event, of strokes, and heart attacks. Um, so it's really important that we're caring for the entire human. Um, it does work with Medicare as a secondary, so uh, the trust starts out as optional. That's one of the ways we get around some of the barriers in the system. The prescription drugs are covered. Um, as long as there is a um, generic that's covered, if you want the brand name and then the generic exists, then there is some out-of-pocket associated with that choice. Um, but otherwise, everything's covered. So, and again, based on uh, Jared Freeman's studies, we would save $9 billion a year covering everything and everybody. Um, Catherine likes to say we save only $9 billion because if we left the system the way it is, uh, covering who we cover and how we cover them, we would save something like $15 billion a year. But because we are covering everything and everybody, uh, every resident of Washington State, that um, brings us down to only a $9 billion a year savings. Um, a resident de as defined by the health care authority, um, so it does include folks that work here for six months at a time. It does include college students. Uh, it is a pretty robust um, re resident description. Um, you can find out more on our website, wholewashington.org. We do have an excellent FAQ, so if yes everything and yes everybody is not enough information, the details are on our website. Uh, next slide, please. A little bit in how we pay for it. So there, we do have to fund the trust. Um, I mentioned it's similar to how we collect monies for insurance right now. It's just not an insurance product. Um, employers will contribute 10.5% of payroll. Um, on average, employers right now are spending um, upwards of 18%, sometimes as high as 22% of payroll on your insurance coverage. This will bring that cost down for businesses, which is great for any size business, but especially small businesses who right now really can't afford to cover health insurance for a vast majority of their employees. Um, employees may contribute up to 2%, so the, the employers are allowed to delegate a portion of those costs. They're also allowed to keep them. They can, as a benefit of employment, say, we want to be the best place to work, so we're going to cover this 2%. Um, then that sole proprietors, folks who own their own business, it is a 2% of earnings, and that's profit, and after the first 15000 right now. Um, so these are taxes. I know people hate to talk about taxes, but realistically, if you think about how much you're paying right now in your premium and your out-of-network costs and your deductibles and your co-pays, mo the vast majority of Washingtonians are going to save money. And the ones that don't are the ones who can't afford to take this extra cost on. Uh, that's the way it's built. Um, we also have some taxes coming in through investors, uh, an 8.5% capital gains tax. If you Google SB 5335 right now, you're going to see some hit pieces that say, they're coming after your houses, they're coming after your retirement. Those two things are literally exempt in this policy. So this is meant to just kind of capture dollars where folks aren't really working real, you know, real jobs and air bunnies. They're, they're investing, their money comes from trading stocks and those kinds of things so that they're paying into the system the way everyone else is. Um, so that, that's, what, that's how we pay for it. Next slide, please. This is how we save money. Uh, there are more details in the Gerald Friedman studies. He's done two for us. 
um, on our website if you're interested. A lot of it is that provider administration. So we talked about the time that's spent in prior authorizations and fighting for the ability to authorize the, the care plan that your doctor or your nurse practitioner or, or your PA has decided you need. There's a ton of time spent right now fighting to implement that care plan. And so uh, moving to a state-based single-payer system like the Washington Health Trust just gets rid of that um, administrative burden. There's also market power, so the ability to negotiate prices. Pharmaceutical co prices, so medication costs, hospital prices, those things that, to answer your question from earlier, um, this is a way to, to help provide some accountability for those um, jacked up prices. <laughs> so uh, we also save money through admin uh, insurance administration, employer administration of insurance every year when employers have to go pick your plan and decide which types of plans underneath your groups are going to exist. So, um, and then there's a capacity for fraud reduction if everybody's billing into the same um, uh, the trust, then it's easier to see if folks are perhaps um, billing a little over what they should be billing or very differently from other providers with the same type of service. Uh, the other things I like about the trust, they're not necessarily part of this slide. There is a, a physician's panel uh, committee that's pulled together to help set some of those charges. There's a recognition right now that Medicare and Medicaid rates might not be enough money to keep their doors open and their lights on, but the insurance rates are highly inflated. So the ability to set those charges in the system exists as part of the policy. Um, there's also a citizen's oversight board, which I like. So if yes, everything and yes, everybody didn't actually mean yes, um, there was a question yesterday uh, about probiotics, for example. Uh, well, once upon a time, if a doctor wrote a prescription, those types of things were covered. That Those types of things might have to be figured out after the trust is implemented, but they would be part of that citizen's oversight board and part of those conversations, which I really appreciate. Um, I think next slide, please. Oh, that's not me. All right, go ahead, Britt. Thank you. really like the idea of the trust, but I just have warfare to talk about again, so I apologize. Um, so this $920.8 billion, we're approaching the, the $1 trillion mark, or the $32,000 years, I guess. Um, the military provides single paid health care to its members. Um, I'm glad someone mentioned Optum earlier because they're also technically single paid. They pay themselves. I kind of forgot about this, but United owns Optum. Optum now owns the Poly Clinic and Everett Clinic. Uh, Optum also owns Change Healthcare, which is a prescription processing company that processes 75% of prescription, uh, electronic prescriptions and billing, and they actually got hacked like a month-ish ago, and it completely seized up our entire healthcare system across the country. It was a terrible week to be a clinic nurse. Um, so they own that as well. So they own uh, United Healthcare also. So it's United Health Group is the umbrella of all of these organizations. So they, you know, if you're a United Group um, health insurance, you go to the Poly Clinic or Optum. Your doctor prescribes you medication that is then processed through the pharmacy benefit manager, which is Optum. Change Healthcare sends that to the pharmacy, which is probably the Optum mail order pharmacy they force you to use now. Um, you pick that medication up after you get a prior authorization <laughs> done most of the time. Um, and the only person really getting paid is, is United Healthcare and Optum. So uh, single paid for them. 43% of working age Americans, I wonder, I don't know what working age means anymore since my grandmother's 81 and still works, so, uh, you know, have no health insurance or were inadequately insured. Um, I know I once upon a time considered getting divorced so my spouse could have Medicaid, uh, but it was too expensive. <laughs> so we just stayed married, which was which is okay. Um, it worked out. Uh, I am a big fan of nursing history. Um, I think it's kind of a forgotten component of our profession.
profession. A lot of us are very jaded, so I like to look back at that kind of thing. And one of the founders of the American Nurses Association, her name was Lavinia Dock. She got arrested a lot protesting for suffrage, but one of her big things that was a lot less popular was anti-war activism. Um, they let her have an angry little column in the nursing journal at the time uh, for, during World War I until she retired. Um, but one of her favorite quotes of mine is, I'll, I'll paraphrase it to shorten it up, but energies devoted to preparation for war are energies taken away from the living. Um, and we dedicate so many energies and monies um, to, to taking life away instead of, you know, preserving it um, in a way that, you know, everyone in our country and the world deserves. Um, and then we have states systematically dismantling Medicaid expansions. Uh, the pandemic is over, I guess. Um, so a lot of those emergency um, things that were in place enabling people to have health care just don't exist anymore. Um, and a lot of us have uh, residual COVID or long COVID, and we're going to see that reflected in health care costs um, now, 5, 10, 20 years. It's going to be really uh, interesting, I guess might be the word for that. Move to the next slide. Um, so nuclear weapons, uh, one of my favorite things to tell people is that if Washington State was its own country, we would be the third largest nuclear power in the world. Um, depending on who someone voted for, for governor, you could really upset them with that statistic. Um, but that is, you know, what we've got here. Uh, my parents live across the street from the Trident submarine base. It's a very angry fence across the street from them. It says, do not cross, and there is a substantial number of nuclear missiles just, just across the water. I know when Russia invaded Ukraine, I thought, gee, that's kind of a big target, I guess, if we kind of, you know, got into it. Thankfully, that, that hasn't happened yet. Um, so there's this idea now, I guess, that we're, we're going to be modernizing our nuclear weapons, which seems kind of provocative to me. And if we were to forgo this plan, we could fund over 15 million nurses' salaries in Washington State. Well, in the United States, there's about 5 million nurses. Um, but I think that in Washington, we tend to be paid decently enough. You know, it has to change with the cost of living, of course, especially because we have unions here. But that means that if we expanded that to nationwide, I think tripling the number of nurses sounds pretty great. And I think that paying them all about as much as I make sounds pretty great too. So um, I think that's a great number and use of that money, but we can go to the next slide. So the cost of this upgrade is going to be taking place over the next 50 years, so up, up until 2075. And when you weigh that with, with medical debt, um, I know someone mentioned Providence earlier. They got in a little bit of trouble, I think, about their charity care program not being <laughs> administered properly. That's my friend and union rep there, so we're highly amused by this. Um, darkly, I guess. Um, nonprofit hospitals, we tend to think nonprofit, innocent, maybe good, I think, is a word people might associate with nonprofits. But people still owe nonprofit hospital systems medical debt. And those hospital systems often have foundations that are technically separate to pursue the quote-unquote mission of the hospital system. Uh, and those foundations invest money in our stock market and some of the hottest stocks right now, unfortunately, um, and probably forever until we stop doing this, are defense, weapons, things that are meant to kill people, which is kind of antithetical to the whole reason that we're in this work. Um, so we have hospitals investing in weapons that hurt people, typically overseas, um, using the debt that we all owe them. Um, but it's a non-profit, so I guess it's okay. Uh, um, you know, the, the person making the profit is going to be the defense contractor. Um, so dedicating billions upon billions of dollars to modernizing this uh, nuclear weapon system as opposed to just providing health care. You have a question? Yeah, I, you said defense twice. Please don't say defense. Yeah. It's military. Yes, military. <laughs> or offense. You know, we 
we do all find it very offensive. So, um, and I believe I got one more slide. There we are. Um, there is a a new show. I don't know how many of you have streaming services on your television, like Amazon. There's a show based on you know I have a favorite video game. It's called Fallout. And it takes place in a post-apocalyptic, you know, nuclear society, kind of the worst of the Cold War fear realized. Um, I actually forgot they're making a show, so I found out about it. I was very excited. Um, it's very well done. I don't know who at Amazon let them make the show. You know, um, I guess they are okay with some circuses <clears throat> for for us, but uh, some some of the scenes. It's supposed to be a very like darkly whimsical universe, but one of the scenes that really got me was, you know, they are anticipating the end of the world, you know, nuclear holocaust, uh, and one of the quotes was, "There's a lot of money to be made at the end of the world," and it was a scene of various technocrats. Um, I'm sure that Jeff Bezos could have a seat at the table uh, discussing how best to make money off of all of the fear. Um, and what society will look like when it's basically just them left. Um, it's also very graphic, so if that's not your thing, caution you now. But I, I was really glad to see that that um, just was very um, thematic throughout the show, because I think it's a really poignant thing for people to see right now, um, expressed in our media. Um, so looking at the medical debt versus upgrading this Sentinel, missile system, you were spending much more on this versus relieving medical debt and like the undo medical debt um, donation fund, you know, it's it's an effective way to eliminate that debt, but when we get up into these numbers where it's $32 years, um, you know, it's 32 years is a billion seconds, uh, there's only so much that we can do and it requires systematic change. Twenty million reasons to cancel medical debt. Over two hundred billion can be better spent. So, All right, me again to take us home. Uh, so, taking action is what we're hoping you're going to do when you leave here today. Um, we're hoping that the stories your own and others in this room have inspired you to do something about it. So, to the point over there was, why are we putting up with this, right? <laughs> why are we putting up with this, and what can we do about it? Um, these links are live. If you want a copy of the slides, please provide a legible email on the table in the back, and we can send you a copy of the slides. You can also use the QR code. They have put a, like, uh, a advertisement, it just passed by the advertisement and the QR code still works, I apologize. Um, capitalism is finest. <laughs> so, uh, pledge to sign is the easiest way to help us change the system and implement the Washington Health Trust. If you pledge to sign our next initiative, we know that we have enough signatures to get on the ballot. We do need 400,000 signatures to get on the ballot. Um, our last three attempts, we've collected 100,000 each time. We know we need to grow our capacity fourfold. That sounds daunting, so I'm going to give you another really fun fact. We have about 18,000 people in our database right now. If all of those folks collected a single page of signatures, that's 20 signatures, we would have 400,000 signatures. So this is very doable. This is something we can do if we take action. Uh, pledge to sign is the, the gateway into this. Uh, you could also sign up to, for our newsletter, check out our website, those kinds of things. Please do donate to the Undo Medical Debt Fundraiser. Uh, there's another opportunity that linked there if you didn't capture the QR code earlier. They're doing great work. You can also find our fundraiser by just going to the Undo Medical Debt page and searching for the Washington State Fundraiser. They have them set up by, um, by state, by geography, so you can find it that way. Call or write your representatives. They need to hear from you. You, they know all of the details that we've told you today. They know it's cheaper. They know it's more effective. They know it can be higher quality. They know it can create accountability. They know all these things. But there's a lot of money telling them not to change the system. So we need to be louder than those dollars that they're collecting from the lobbyists. Um, 
We need to be louder. You can submit public commentary to the Universal Health Care Commission. Washington State does have a Universal Health Care Commission running right now. They meet every month. Um, the Universal Health Care Commission meets one month. The Finance Committee meets the next month. You absolutely can participate in that conversation. It takes about 90 seconds to give public commentary as part of those meetings. You can also give them that feedback in an email if you're not comfortable being on that stage. They do need to hear from us. Um, you can subscribe to the Universal Healthcare Commission announcements so you know when those meetings are coming. They're usually during the work day, from 2 to 4 in the afternoon kind of thing, sometimes from 12 to 2. Um, you can, you know, I log in on my phone while I'm at work and just kind of listen to it as a podcast. Uh, so, and being involved and showing up shows them that we're watching, that we care, that we really are invested in how this policy uh, gets developed. Uh, these are slower pathways. It would be easier for us to not have to collect 400,000 signatures. It would be easier for us, for the commission, to give strong policy guidance to our legislature. It would be easier for us if the legislature implemented a policy like the Washington Health Trust. Also very thankful that we have this other pathway to kind of force it through if we need to. Um, National Nurses United, uh, I do pay dues to both WSNA and National Nurses United. Um, NNU is working on the national level, like Physicians for National Health Plan, uh, like some other the orgs we've heard about, a PSR has their National Demand Access Campaign. NNU is another great organization in this fight, and their Patient Over Profits Pledge is something you can bring to your favorite candidate, something you can bring to your representative. It says, I pledge not to take more than $250 from this medical industrial complex, if you will because that money and politics piece is the biggest driver of not changing the system, right? So uh, that's another way. You could also pass a resolution in your union, in your party, in your wherever resolutions exist. We do have a sample resolutions available for that, uh, for you to bring this issue forward and, and collect that support from your organization. So that's another great way to get involved and take action in this space. Uh, one more plug for the cancel the Sentinel, uh, cancel the Sentinel because it's a waste of money, period, and that money would be better spent on health care. It would be better spent on lots of things, but we're focusing on health care today. It's so another opportunity to grab that QR code and uh, put your name on this um, for PSR. We really appreciate you taking the time to let our legislators know that this is important to us. We really need to reprioritize how we're spending. You can also share your story. We really appreciate the folks that were brave enough to come to the mic today and share your story. If you're willing to share that story a little more publicly, we are using these stories uh, you know, on our social media to promote this idea, to promote these events. We would very much appreciate if folks are willing to share their story in this capacity. Um, and it makes a difference. It, how we change hearts and minds is often with storytelling. It's often with connecting folks with the issue, reminding them that they also are in this boat. You know, none of us get out of this alive, right? But what does the life look like um, if we're not taking care of each other? So really uh, would love if you could support us by sharing your stories in this capacity. I think that's the last slide, right? Yes. All right. Do we have time for questions? Okay, great. Time for questions? I'll try to take yeah, all of them. That's okay. I, I have so, <laughs> yeah, right? Again, there's a great FAQ page on our website if your question doesn't get answered. But one of the main things that I like about the Washington Health Trust is that health equity piece. So the Washington Health Trust takes our tiered medical system and puts everybody in the same pool. So doctors don't need to worry about the dollars associated with each individual patient because a service is a service is a service. 
uh, the state uh, Washington Health Trust is going to pay X amount of dollars for a colonoscopy, regardless of what your situation looks like. So we don't need to restrict the number of Medicaid folks on our um, doctor's lists because they're not paid enough. They also don't need to chase patients that bring in more money. Everybody's tied to the same amount of dollars. So it really provides a platform for true health equity that does not exist in the tiered for-profit system we're running right now. So that one answer to your question. Um, one, I really love that part. Go ahead. I was just wondering if I could go to the order now. Uh, yeah, let me finish answering your question, then I'd love that. So um, the other pieces of your questions were, uh, how do the services get that dollar amount? Um, will be set by a committee that is established as part of the policy, right? So that kind of like, how much will it be? We don't know those questions going in. There's only so much you can cover in a, pol in a legislative policy, right? Uh, but there are uh, there is an opportunity with that board, that provider board that gets established for providers who work in those spaces to give real genuine feedback about how much those services should cost, how much it's going to cost to take care of those patients, what those charges should look like. So there's opportunity there to kind of set it somewhere in the middle. We know it won't be as low as Medicare, Medicaid rates. We also know it won't be the inflated prices without any kind of framework for accountability. The Gerald Friedman study um, estimated based on the assumption that providers would like to make the same amount of money they're making right now, so making sure that providers aren't taking an overall pay cut, but that services are, are balanced out. Does that make sense? Okay. And then was there one more piece of your question? I, I, well, the out-of-state piece. The out-of-state oh. piece. Okay, so it's based on residency. So the Washington Health Trust covers Washington residents. If you go to uh, the East Coast for a conference, the Washington Health Trust is still going to pay for whatever services you needed while you were in D.C. because you're a Washington resident, as long as you meet that residential criteria. Yeah. Um, it does not cover out of country. It covers out of state. Yeah. Catherine, go ahead. Also, I'm going to order it before I forget. I just wanted to, since this is in Seattle, um, in solidarity, since we are a signature gathering organization, we are um, collecting signatures for I-137. So if you live in Seattle and vote for a city council person and have not had a chance to sign that or look at it, I've got a petition back there. I didn't want to forget. <laughs> It is yes, social for housing. social housing. Um, yeah, yeah, so I can answer any questions back there as much as I know. So, absolutely. And absolutely, so good in the order? Yeah, PNHD National is putting on a webinar this coming Monday at 5 p.m. our time on uh, the harm, this new massive study that they just published uh, last week on the harms of Medicare Advantage, how for profit, private, harms both patients uh, particularly, but also the providers who are involved in that system. And over here you can, a, you can get the link to that. That's, there's like 1,800 people across the country signed up for that webinar, so I think it's really an important piece that awesome. we have time. The date and time again, David? It's 5 p.m. our time. 5 p.m. on which day? Monday, Monday, June 3rd. Okay, great. Thank you. And it's going to be followed immediately by our local PNHD Washington chapter meeting. Um, if people are interested in attending, how do they find the link? Uh, you can get it right here or it's on our PNHP Washington website. On the PNHP Washington uh, website. You can just pick it up. All right. I'm, the camera, you know, if people aren't in the room. <laughs> That way you'll get more, more folks from online, hopefully. Any other questions or good of the order? Catherine, do you want to say anything about our event on June 8th?
Thank you. All right. Uh, big thanks to everybody for coming out. Uh, some of the organizers will stick around if you all want to have some conversations. Uh, we have the space until 5.30. We're not going to stay until 5.30, but there's, there's no big rush. <laughs>